Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Wow, a few little bit to let folks in, trickle in, but you are here this evening for our presentation for her story, which is about Maxine Dunlap and a little extra bonus of the history of gliding in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we have that happening for you. And thank you so much for those who were interested in attending on March 1st and coming back at the end of the month um, and being flexible with us. So that is really nice. And, and this photo I have, just a little sneak peek, is um, from our San Francisco News Call Bulletin photo morgue. And this is Maxine Dunlap um, at Ocean Beach in 1929. So there we go. Okay, I'm gonna get us started. Um, you are here for part of our Her Story program. Um, this is us celebrating women, um, and we kind of do this every day, but we focused in March for um, Women's History Month, um, and we've had a lot of great programs, and we kind of continue, we'll, we'll continue, we usually like to trickle out of each designated month. Um, and speaking of her, I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Christina Moretta, and I work as the photo curator in the San Francisco History Center. And I am here to present our program. I'm gonna um, do a land acknowledgement as part of the program um, start and then review a little bit uh, before we get our presenters going. So, here we go. I still have to read it because I don't have it memorized yet. Um, the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. And uh, we honor the peoples for their enduring commitment to Mother Earth as the indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions. The Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded lost nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit and we will uh, honor, respectfully honor Ramatush peoples as we must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge and in how we care for San Francisco and all its people. And um, feel free to share in the chat which land you are from, I'm visiting from. Um, so, so a library, we have books here, but we also have lots of programs. So some of you may be new to what we're up to for San Francisco Public Library, and welcome to one of our virtual programs. And we're kind of still doing a little blend of virtual and hybrid is what we like to call them. So I'm gonna share a few things. Oh, and in person. Um, <laughs> um, I'm gonna share a few things that are coming up. Um, we have what's called on the same page where we're kind of all reading the same book for a couple months. And so the next one is Post-Colonial Love Poem by Natalie Diaz. And we have our author event with her in conversation with Michelle Cruz Gonzalez on Tuesday, April 26th. We have a presentation for climate change um, about Rodeo Lagoon. So that's next Tuesday. And so April is Climate Action Month. Um, and we have another one, um, Our 
Earth Embracing All Communities uh, uh, next or in about 10 days, April 9th. Um, we have a presentation on smart water gardening, gardening. And here's something that will be in person at the main library in the Corret Auditorium. Um, it's going to be a presentation of Hollywood Shakes. So all the times that the 1906 earthquake and fire has started, starred in movies on the Hollywood screen. So this one should be a fun one. Um, we have a Ecosex walking tour, another in-person opportunity for you. And this is coming up um, towards the end of the month. And this one I'm pretty excited about because I was really excited about um, Emily St. John Mandel, Mandel's new book coming out. So um, I had my moment with Station Eleven. So um, this will be a great thing coming up. And then for those who are liking photos and want to, you know, do a workshop on photos, we have this um, coming up. Uh, it's held the last Monday of the month. So yesterday was, there's one through April is our last time. Okay. I just threw a lot at you. So <laughs> you got your teasers. So I am here to introduce um, our speakers. Um, I will say that I first got to know Gary virtually and Madison because they're greeting us from San Diego. This is kind of the fun part about um, having virtual programs is, um, but I first got to know, get to know Gary, um, oh, I think it was three years ago now. Um, and uh, it was, he was looking for photos of aerials of Ocean Beach because of a woman, Maxine Dunlap, who you'll hear more about. And, um, and so actually I want, I'm gonna just leave it at that because I don't wanna give away too much more. Um, so, but that's just been like a fun part of my job is getting to know people, their interests. And then you're like, yeah, what, what who is this person? What are they up to? So um, I always get to learn more history of San Francisco by um, doing, uh, reference questions. So, so it's um, me who's hosting this as well as my colleagues, JP and Anissa. So um, they're the other little spirals behind the scenes. Um, so we got representation for the library. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our presenters. Dr. Gary Fogel is a um, has a diverse background in biology and earth science, as well as aerospace. And that has prompted his interest in the evolution of flight, the use of, um, let's see, da -da, um, and the history of gliding and so soaring. Having been involved with aero modeling for much of his life, including free flight model airplanes, model rockets, and radio controlled aircraft. He has established numerous national and world, world, world records for aero models. He's also authored several books on the history of gliding and helped preserve the Torrey Pines Glider Port as a historic site. Um, he's also an adjunct faculty at San Diego State University where he teaches um, an introductory course on aerospace engineering. Um, and then he even has a Wikipedia page, people. So <laughs> there's more there too. And then Madison Chiquito is a second year business major with minors in computer science and international studies at San Diego State University. Last year, she worked as director at a female-led and STEM-focused nonprofit, Make, Maker Girl. And she first discovered her love for space after spending countless hours behind the telescopes at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, Madison is a Bay Area native as well. And so her love for space has only continued to grow since spending the past two summers as a research intern at NASA Ames Research Center. And Dunlap holds a special place in Madison's heart since they were both born and raised here. Um, 
So I am going to let you two take it away. So let me do some handing off of sharing screens. No problem. So, oopsies. Okay. Got it. Just a yeah. second. Can you see that, right? Yes. All good. good. Perfect. Okay. So thank you again for the opportunity to come speak today uh, for the San Francisco Public Library. It's been great to work with staff uh, in preparation for this um, this work, which was published first at the at an AAA conference uh, earlier this year. Uh, Madison helped out a lot in the research and writing the into the paper and the presentation. So what we're going to do today is first give you some background about flight in the Bay Area and the development of the history before Maxine, so that then uh, Madison can focus on Maxine's history. And then I'll close a little bit with more modern um, representations of what's happening in gliding in the Bay Area to bring it up to present. So the Bay Area, is a, it's been a, a hotbed for aviation uh, for many, many, many years, longer than I think most people realize. And of course, while we're going to focus on women's history, uh, focusing on Matt's, Maxine Dunlap's history in particular today, we really wanted to provide this context because this context is so important to really understand why Maxine got interested in flight and, and how so many other people got interested in flight and why that all happened in the Bay Area, uh, a history which definitely includes women, uh, more women than just Maxine Dunlap. So even back to, to Independence Day 1869, uh, one of the first flights that was ever made in the Bay Area was an unpiloted dirigible, a, a small scale dirigible uh, called the Avatar Hermes Jr., which was flown or test flown at Shell Mound Park near San Francisco International Airport today. Uh, you can see this was a rather large un unpersoned vehicle uh, on, the, on the right hand side. You can see the pictures of the photos of the, the persons helping out with that experiment. And that was the first recorded unpowered I'm sorry, unpiloted powered aircraft to fly in America uh, in, in the Bay Area, uh, 1869. That kind of started flight in the Bay Area. Not long after, uh, other people were experimenting with lighter than air aircraft balloons and also experimenting with parachutes. So the first recorded parachute jump in Western American history happened in San Francisco in January of 1887. A gentleman named Thomas Baldwin had the bravery to jump out of a basket of a balloon with a parachute and come floating back down uh, in Golden Gate Park. This was from Park Van Tassel's eclipse balloon. This sparked a whole ex exposition of aerial uh, entrepreneurs that wanted to get into this, into this hobby and actually make money as aerial exhibitionists into the early 1900s by jumping out of balloons or off buildings with parachutes, uh, even at places like Glen Park in San Francisco. And those performances often included women uh, Layla, Adair, Essie Viola, Millie Viola, all sisters, it happened to turn out, uh, would make performances at areas in San Francisco uh, for paying customers. Daredevils. It was also the case that the first piloted dirigible uh, was flown in the Bay Area. This was now in, in early 1900s when heavier than air flight was just coming onto the scene. Uh, a gentleman named August Greith was making experiments with large dirigibles in San Francisco and this dirigible pictured on the right, the California Eagle, made its first flight in San Francisco. Uh, it's really, I think, the first dirigible flight, the first successful flight. One of his ex assistants, this gentleman, Thomas Baldwin, who was uh, familiar with the parachuting, um, became his aeronaut and then took the idea, made his own dirigible called the California Arrow, made some test flights in the East Bay with that and became known as the father of the dirigible in America's history. So the first dirigible flight, also a Bay Area achievement. In the 1880s, a gentleman named John Montgomery was experimenting with gliders here in San Diego. These were the first controlled flights in a heavier than air aircraft in America's history. He became a professor at Santa Clara College in South Bay, an expert in, in aerodynamics and the wind circulation to generate lift from aircraft wings. Uh, he made in 1905 an exhibition, the first public exhibition of heavier than air flight in America's history with an aeronaut that he had trained, Daniel Maloney, to make this flight. Carried aloft by a balloon, the glider would release from the balloon and come gliding back down again uh, for some very excited people below. Uh, he also made glider flights in San Jose in 1911, helping to invent new control systems and show the public that heavier than air flight was possible. Because of those flights by several people, uh, gliding became very popular, especially with younger audiences. And in 1909, there was a popular mechanics article 
uh, written by Carl Bates on how to build a glider, which sparked interest in many younger people at the time, uh, building their own gliders in their own garages from sticks and cloth to see if they too could fly off hillsides. It was just a picture like shown on the right. Some Bay Area enthusiasts got hooked on gliding at that same time. One of them was Cleve Schaefer, who established the Pacific Aero Club in San Francisco in 1909. He constructed one of these gliders, a glider that's shown in the top picture on the right, which would be pulled aloft with ropes to get it going. Uh, his sister, uh, Geneve Schaefer, uh, took the first flight by a woman in one of glider. It's actually the first, believed to be the first woman to have flown anything that's heavier than air uh, in the United States, uh, credited by the Smithsonian as being the first flight by a woman in America, also happening in the Bay Area. Uh, Geneve also ended up making balloon flights, some of the first balloon flights in the Western US by women uh, in late 1909. These other, uh, other kids in the general area were building hang gliders uh, very often. One of them was uh, the Ort brothers, Ernst, Ernest Ort and his brother. Uh, they formed what was called the San Francisco Aero Club. Uh, they have this hang glider that was shown here on the right in the newspapers at the time. Again, this is pulling it aloft with ropes to get it started. And you go to a very high sand dune and get pulled aloft and glide back down. These flights were made at 19th Street and Quintara Street uh, on the big sand dunes that we'll show you pictures of coming up. These first flights were in 1910. So people were flying gliders on the west side of San Francisco since 1910. Uh, and you'll see that again, these dunes will come into picture when we talk about Maxine in just a little bit. I wanna be clear though, that there's different types of gliding and soaring and what's the difference between the two. In the 1910s, 1900s, uh, the te technology of gliding was such that people would go to the top of a hillside, uh, stand aloft, be towed aloft with a, with a rope or jump off this hill, glide to the bottom of the hill, just using gravity to glide back down and then have to walk the glider back up again and do the same thing again, over and over again. These were fun flights, but not very high altitude and very short duration typically of the hang glider type where you're hanging from the glider itself. It wasn't until 1911 that people realized that when wind hits a hill like this is depicted on the right, the wind gets turned up like an inverted waterfall of air. And if you know what you're doing with a motorless aircraft, you can get into that lifting current and soar back and forth and remain aloft at the same altitude you took off from or either or even gain altitude. And the first person to have accomplished that in world history was Orville Wright at Kitty Hawk in 1911. He had returned to Kitty Hawk specifically to try out this idea of soaring like a bird. And so people have only been doing soaring flight for almost hundred, more than just over a hundred years now. Uh, it's not, it's very brand new technology versus the gliding that had happened back into the 1800s, 1880s and 1890s. Powered flight also has uh, origination in the Bay Area. A gentleman named Feng Ru, who have also researched recently, uh, built and powered, built his, and, and designed his own aircraft, his own powered aircraft in the East Bay, uh, successfully making a flight in September of 1909, one of the first flights in California's history, uh, very likely the first powered flight in California's history. Uh, he later ended up returning to China uh, to help establish the first Chinese Air Force, taking the powered air flight technology and bringing it back to Asia. But it really was Charles Lindbergh's crossing of the Atlantic in 1927 that generated immediate interest, national interest in aviation. Uh, this was an incredible renaissance of interest in aviation um, and generated uh, the, the, the kids at that time were wondering how they could become uh, Lucky Lindy and what how, gliding then represented an, an easy way and a very inexpensive way to get into the air. Uh, Amelia Earhart also became the first woman to cross the Atlantic uh, and then also the first to fly from Honolulu back to the west coast of America. She was based in Oakland at the Oakland airport, generated huge local interest in women's aviation uh, at that same time. And so you have these two large figures in America's history, really sparking interest in flight, powered flight, and also gliding flight. And just at that same time, just weeks before Lindbergh's flight, Mills Field Municipal Airport, which is now San Francisco International was dedicated on May 7th, 1927. And because of those activities, other regional airports right away became powered flight destinations. But the Great Depression came and reinforced that these were expensive opportunities to try to learn how to be Lindbergh. And gliding flight again became a very inexpensive way to get into the air, especially for youth in America. And with that, I'd like to then uh, hand it off to Madison and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about Maxine Dunlap.
All right, so we'll start off with Maxine's early years. She was born in 1908 in Alameda, California. Um, she graduated from Oakland High School in 1927 with an interest in business, and she worked as a local stenographer for an attorney. Um, just a fun fact, my Nana actually graduated from Oakland High School. Not sure what year, but I'm guessing after 1929. So maybe two notable alums right there. But anyways, Lindbergh and Earhart really piqued her interest. Um, and she started an aviatrix club for women at Mills Field in 1929. So when she was working as a stenographer, she kind of just wasn't really getting fulfilled out of that. And she just found this passion for um, just gliding so we'll explore that in the later slides thank you very much okay so maxine she showed an early proficiency proficiency for flight um on the right you can see pictured her flight instructor uh lieutenant lieutenant donald templeman of the u.s army it is reported that she completed a loop on her first solo flight and then after the loops came spins uh with templeman she made national news as the flying stenographer she expressed interest in a flight from California to Hawaii, but there was no records of her actually making an attempt. Um, and on April 1st, um, just a month or so after the stunts on the right, you can see the article was posted in January 30th, 1929. So just almost a little over like a month after um, her first flights with Templeman, she received a private pilot's license on April 1st, 1929 at Mills Field, and it was the first private pilot's license awarded at Mills. And then we have the Oakland Air Circus. Uh, Dunlap competed in the in the Air Circus in April 1929, the same month she had gotten her license, so busy month for her, um, at the Oakland Airport with two other very important women aviators, Marvel Crossan and Bar Bobby Trout. You can see them pictured on the right. Um, this was one of the first all women air races. However, um, Dunlap came in second, earning $100. She placed second behind Marvel Crossan. And on the right, you can also see like a pretty iconic um, news clipping from the Oakland Tribune which says they'll be friendly rivals. And you can see these three very powerful women in flight. Um, and I just think that's like an awesome news clipping. So I just wanted to bring attention to it. And then Maxine is just 1929 was her year. She makes um, an attempt for the endurance record. Uh, however, this was an unsuccessful attempt to exceed Louise Stadden's endurance mark of 22 hours aloft. On the right, you can see a nice little picture of Louise in the cockpit. And then we'll jump and talk about the California Gliders Club, which will prove to be play a bigger role in Maxine's story later on. So the, the California Gliders Club was formed in 1928 in San Francisco. It was led by U.S. Army Warrant Officer Charles Ferguson. On the right, you can see Ferguson in the club's primary glider. This was the second glider club affiliated with the Evans Glider Clubs of America, which eventually became known as the National Glider Association. Um, so they purchased this primary glider in early 1929, and then the club grew to have 50 members. You can see that this was posted in the Los Angeles Times on January 9th, 1929. So around the same time that Maxine first started her flight lessons with Templeman. And a little bit more about the California Gliders Club. Um, the glider operations were made from a large sand dune field near Terrible Street and 35th Avenue west of San Francisco starting in January 1929. This glider club made local, state, and national news. California was known to have the most licensed powered aircraft pilots of any state in the nation, so it was only natural for them to try gliding. They, in fact, they even established a junior Air Scouts division where young boys could join for free. However, um, you do have a little fun fact with this one. One young aviator attempted to turn with the primary glider and he actually slid off the seat. But however, he was OK. He fell into the sand, thankfully. But as a result of this, um, a seatbelt was installed in the primary glider for the best, for sure. <laughs> And just to point out uh, some photos that were recently provided by the 
San Francisco Public Library. Um, these sand dunes are on the on the west side of uh, San Francisco here, pictured on the right and on the left. Uh, the gliding flights here, uh, we spoke about the Ork Brothers earlier. They're over here near Sunset Reservoir. Some of the flights were made uh, to the west of the sand dunes, and most of the flights were back here uh, near the Sunset Reservoir. These photos are from 1936, so it's a little bit more developed than it was back in 1929. Go ahead, Madison. Great, thank you. All right, and this is one of Maxine's most notable accomplishments. She was the first woman to receive a glider's license of any kind. So just to note, six of the first 10 aviators to receive a third class glider's license in the US were members of the California Gliders Club. So we had some pretty elite um, pilots and gliders in the California Glider Club. Um, you can see Maxine coming in at number three. Uh, like I said, she was the first woman to receive a glider's license of any kind. A uh, third class glider's license required a 30 second duration. Maxine got her license with flying colors, 50 seconds aloft and 990 feet for her first or for her glider's license. And on, on the right, you can see a pretty, oh, sorry. On the right, you can see a pretty iconic photo of Maxine. I think this one's um, really, she just looks awesome in this one. So <laughs> I wanted to draw attention to it. And then here's some footage of Dunlap's first flights. I thought this was um, really, really cool to include just because I didn't realize how crazy glider pilot people were until I saw this. She looks like she's just floating. It's like, doesn't, well, this isn't, this is sped up. You can see um, not the full 50 seconds, but here we go. Yeah, we do believe this is one of the first two flights she made. And you can see the yeah. people running in the background are, are, are running faster than normal. So that was 50 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> smashed into 20 seconds. Um, but you get the idea off the sand dunes. And then they'd, they'd haul the glider back up and someone else would jump in and do the same kind of uh, have fun flights. Sorry, here we are. Thank you. And then we have Dunlap in the Ferguson primary glider pictured on the right. Um, these flights were from a high sand dune at the Rivera Street and 23rd Avenue, which is roughly the current location of Abraham Lincoln High School. It is reported that Dunlap had never seen a glider until shortly before her first hop, which I think is really, really cool. You can see her pictured on the right. And I, 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 this is one of my favorite like news clippings. So this made national media attention. It was a huge deal. Um, all across the country. It says Bay Girl licensed as first US woman glider pilot. And you can just see, like I said, it looks like they're floating, floating along into fame. It just is the craziest thing. This was April 29th, 1929. Uh, same month that she got her private pilot's license, just a couple months after she had started her flight lessons, which really just shows how much of a knack she had for flying. And then this is how um, we're going to tie the California Glider Club back into Maxine's storyline. So here we go. May 13th, 1929, Charles Ferguson announces he plans to cross the Golden Gate from the north side to the Presidio using the club glider. Naturally, this led to a lot of disagreement within the club. The club members were like, well, that's all of our glider. We all use that. You can't do this crazy attempt and expect us to be okay with that. And Ferguson argued, well, this is my, this is my club. This is my personal property. And this disagreement plays out in the local papers for the entire public to see. Ferguson actually goes to make this attempt, um, despite the disagreement from the club um, on May 30th, however, an attorney secured an injunction just prior to his lunch launch, so he was unable to make this attempt. Um, legal issues escalated through June into July, taking all the fun out of glider operations, and eventually Ferguson was removed as club president. And while this is all going on, Maxine uh, decides to just continue her efforts in powered flight. Um, from June 3rd to June 8th uh, in 1929, Maxine Dunlap, Bobby Trout, and Marvel Crossing get together again, they get the, back, the band back together. They make a good wheel tour of the seven Cal Northern California cities, starting in Sacramento and ending in Monterey, which must have just been completely gorgeous. That'd be awesome to do. And in September 12th, she was all, 1929 was a big year for her. Se September 20th. 
September 12th, 1929, she gets married to her um, flight instructor, Donald Templeman, which is kind of crazy. And then this soap opera that is the California Gliders Club begin, uh, continues to play out. Uh, Ferguson finally makes up with the club, but October 9th, the same year, he again announces a plan to glide across the Golden Gate. He initially proposed as line point to Chrissy Field, north to south, north to south, but the reality was a launch at Chrissy Field, north via air tow launch to 2,000 feet. And he, December 8th, 1929, he goes to make this attempt. However, the first attempt resulted in a forced landing at a high speed, damaging the landing gear on the primary glider. And if this wasn't telling enough, he goes on to make a second attempt, which results in a slack in the line, then tremendous tension, pulling the front of the glider off and ejecting Ferguson, who died on impact. Um, this was like a very, very, very sad ending for Ferguson. But it was like he wouldn't stop until he made this attempt. So in this attempt, the club primary glider was destroyed and the California Gliders Club was kind of left in um, shambles at this point. Until Maxine Dunlap steps in. So in early March 1930, the next year, Maxine was elected as the new president of the California Glider Club. She was the first woman to be president of a glider club in the U.S. And the club is reborn with 75 members. Um, you can also see that other glider clubs began to form. We have the Floyd Bennett Glider Club, the Bay Cities Glider Club, and the San Francisco Gliders Club. And on the right, another great news clipping from the Oakland Tribune. Girl is head of glider club. And you just see Maxine looking super cool and important. <laughs> So at that same time, because of Maxine's involvement in gliding, um, women in other areas of the nation, especially in California, um, began to have interest in gliding too. One of those was Ann Lindbergh. And so, of course, Charles Lindbergh already had considerable fame uh, and had known of a gentleman named Holly Bolas in San Diego, who was the superintendent of construction on the Spirit of St. Louis. So we already had a, con a connection to this Bolas gentleman in San Diego. And Bolas was a recognized glider champion by that time. So Charles came to San Diego uh, specifically with intent on learning how to do soaring. Uh, but along with Charles came Anne, and Anne expressed interest uh, to do this as well uh, in 1930. They both took lessons from Holly Bolas here in San Diego. And it would be remiss in any uh, Her Story month uh, about gliding to not mention Anne, Anne Lindbergh's fame because here in San Diego, she became the first woman in America to receive a first class glider license uh, with her flight in January, 1930 here in San Diego. Uh, Maxine's license was the third class glider license. There was third, second, and first. First being the hardest to achieve and with considerable flight experience already achieved the third, the second, and the first in one flight uh, here in San Diego. Both Anne and Maxine and other women really opened up soaring for women in general across America. Uh, and there's the national news, all Maxine, Ann Lindbergh, and Ruth Alexander, and other general, other ladies uh, presenting to, to the gentleman at the time that women can do this too. Uh, the Lindberghs flew from Point Loma here in San Diego, also made a trip to near Bakersfield to do soaring, also made a trip to Carmel to do soaring on, on Big Sur, uh, just south of Carmel. And at that event, when Charles Lindbergh and Ann Lindbergh came to, to Northern California, they happened to land at Mills Field to, to get to start on their journey to go down, down south to Carmel and got to meet Maxine Dunlap. So it was the first time that Maxine had ever met the Lindberghs. And it was this connection between both Ann and Maxine that I think was lasting for both of them. Here's a picture of Ann getting in the cockpit on the right of a Bola sailplane here in San Diego in 1930. Because of Ann Lindbergh's accomplishments here in town in San Diego, a, a women's glider club formed called the Ann Lindbergh's Glider Club. You can see them all here waving. Um, there were glider clubs that then formed specifically for women all around the nation uh, because of these activities. The soap opera that was happening at the California Glider Club at this time um, sort of precluded this happening in San Francisco, but Maxine's involvement in getting that club restarted made it sure that women could also join that club too. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Fogel. We'll go back to Maxine and her aerial demonstrations. 
like I said earlier, she was able to complete like a loop on her first solo flight, just very, very proficient in flight. So um, she assisted with an aerial demonstration for Harbor Day over San Francisco in, on August 21st, 1930. On the right, you can see her pictured with powered aircraft. And then unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for um, Maxine, she divorces Lieutenant Templeman, September 14th, 1933. They were married for a little bit under four years. Um, they're divorced due to his erratic behavior and alcoholism. However, she goes to remarry um, Joseph J. Bennett, a Coca-Cola executive in Dallas on October 14th, 1934. And on the right, you can see just how, I guess, important or public uh, Maxine is just because her divorce and her wedding is um, reported on in the LA Times and Oakland Tribune. This just goes to say, like, see how much of a like superstar she was and how much she made the news for her accomplishments and her personal life. So, And then we have the woman's speed record. At the Tulsa Southwest Air Races, Dunlap established a new world speed record for women in light planes. And she set this all just around, all around to 76.8 miles per hour over a 100 kilometer course. Uh, she did this from Tulsa to Oak Mogi. Wow. On June 29th, 1935. Um, on the right, you can see the aircraft she did this in, which is pretty awesome. I think, um, yeah, thank you. And it was, a, it was a test of a new Spartan aircraft. So Spartan Aircraft Company was based in Tulsa. And part of this was a test to show the speed of this aircraft. And they effectively got Maxine to set this record to show how wonderful Maxine was, but also how wonderful Spartan aircraft are. Yay. <laughs> and unfortunately we don't know as much as we would like to know on Maxine's uh, later years, this is the photo on the right that you saw in the beginning of the presentation. We do know that she moved to New Orleans and assisted in the 99th chapter in that area. Then she moved back to California, living there till at least the 1970s. It is believed she passed away in Dallas on October 9th, 1996. In conclusion, Maxine is a daring woman aviator who rose quickly to national fame for her efforts with powered and unpowered aircraft, largely in California. She was the first woman to earn a glider's license, the first woman to serve as a glider's club president, and she established a world speed record for women in light aircraft. And in her later years, she helped to promote the importance of 99s nationally. Along with all these accomplishments that are very, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, tangible, Maxine really paved the way for females to join gliding and just get into flight in general. Gliding was, an, like Dr. Fogel said, an inexpensive way for um, kids and younger people to get into flight. And Maxine really showed that not only can younger people get into flight, but they can get into it very quickly. And females were very, very welcomed in, well, not welcomed, but they were rooted for in the sport. So. I should mention also that the 99s are an organization specifically for the advancement of women in aviation. That organization was started at the same time uh, we've been speaking about with uh, people like Amelia Earhart, uh, Bobby Trout, Marble Cross, and other people, along with Maxine, being there to help promote uh, nationally uh, the importance of women's aviation. So the 99 still exists today to help promote women in aviation nationally. So, um, Madison, thank you for that part on Maxine. I want to, though, put a, another ending part on the gliding part because there's been so much that's happened uh, since the time of Maxine uh, that it's, again, remiss to say that we just stopped in gliding at 1930 and that's the end of gliding. Um, I think many people don't realize how important gliders were in World War II, for instance. So there were these very, very large gliders that were developed. Um, both every, every allied force had a glider division um, uh, almost every army in, in, in World War II had some kind of gliding capability. They were towed behind very, very large aircraft, uh, generally to bring troops behind enemy lines for invasions like D-Day or other types of invasions to plant uh, uh, 
personnel behind enemy lines so that when you have an invasion, you're already attacking uh, the enemy from both sides. Um, these very courageous pilots would fly these gliders uh, armed only with a pistol and the instructions to get back through enemy lines, to get back to London, for instance, to go do another uh, assault glider uh, behind enemy lines. So very dangerous missions involved. It was, as I mentioned early on in the, in the presentation, we started out with gliding just down hills with gravity helping us out, getting to the bottom and going, yay, we survived. Uh, then we figured out how to do soaring by understanding how wind hits ridges and creates lift, and we can stay in that as a sailplane pilot. And that was known, again, from 1911 on um, thermal soaring. These types of, of cumulus clouds that you might see on a, on a, on a day uh, have lifting currents under them called thermals. And sometimes you see birds using them and circling in the lift. People learned in the 1930s, 1920s, and 1930s, that it would be possible to fly in a sailplane and fly in those kinds of same conditions and go up underneath clouds as well. And you can then transfer that altitude into distance and do cross-country soaring, which is a lot of fun. Also in the 1950s, people recognized that when a, when a jet stream, for instance, hits a very, very large mountain range like the Sierra Nevada, it generates a wave behind the Sierra Nevada of considerable size and distance. Uh, these, these waves can go thousands of feet into the air, 40,000, 60,000 feet into the air, uh, and go for distances from the Sierra Nevada all the way across the state of Nevada into Montana, that kind of a thing. So you have systems of waves. And it's possible as a sailplane pilot to fly in these waves, if you know what you're doing, uh, in these lifting areas in the blue, uh, with no motor at all, and go up to tremendous altitudes because the energy is there in the atmosphere ready for us to use. Uh, so glider pilots, sailplane pilots are very proficient at trying to look at the atmosphere and extract energy without any kind of propulsion and use what nature gives you rather than compete with nature. So gliding has continued in the Bay Area. It's, it continued to grow after World War II. Uh, notably, um, the, the Ames, NASA Ames, uh, they had their own soaring club for quite some time that morphed into becoming the Northern California Soaring Association, which still exists today. Uh, a very large club. You can take a ride in a sailplane if you're interested. There's also the Bay Area Soaring Associates group and also down at Hollister. You can take rides in sailplanes in Hollister if that's of interest after this presentation, hopefully will be, especially if you're a woman. Uh, the Bay Area has also become a center for the sports of hang gliding and paragliding uh, since the 1970s and 1990s, respectively. Along the coastline at Fort Funston, there's the club, the Fellow Feathers of Fort Funston Hang Glider Club. And also there's the Bay Area Paragliding Association that fly, both those clubs fly from many sites, including Fort Funston, all across the Bay Area uh, in ultralight aircraft. These are uh, fabric aircraft that have a, a particular frame, or in the case of a paraglider, no frame at all, but it's like a parachute with an airfoil and it can control the airfoil and stay up in the air and effectively be a bird and use all these different types of lift that I've mentioned, uh, we've mentioned in the lecture. And then lastly, um, radio control gliding uh, has also been very popular in the Bay Area, both ridge soaring, as I've mentioned, and also thermal soaring. Uh, there's two different clubs, probably more, the North Bay Soaring Society and the South Bay Soaring Society are the two that I'm most familiar with. But also there's an international organization that formed out of the Bay Area called the League of Silent Flight, which is a proficiency group uh, for radio controlled model soaring. Uh, different levels of achievement, just like there's the third class, second class, and first class glider license in, in real soaring, there's this League of Silent Flight that has different proficiency levels of, of technique. Uh, and that is now an international kind of level of what are you level four, level five pilot, you know, in, 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 the, in the world, which is interesting. All of that started from this radio controlled type of flying in the Bay Area from the 1960s to today. So uh, both Madison and I would love to thank uh, not only the, the San Francisco History Center for, for allowing us to give this presentation, but for the San Diego Air and Space Museum as well for their archives, great archives to be able to pull from and also use photos from. Again, this lecture was pr first provided to the the AIAA, the American Institute of, Electro of uh, uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, we did that through the, the SciTech meeting that they have annually, and Madison gave a great presentation at that uh, event. Um, but specifically today, we'd love to thank the San Francisco Public Library, specifically Christina and Jean-Pierre, uh, for inviting us and providing us the material that you've seen, uh, some of the wonderful photos of the Bay Area in celebration of not only Maxine Dunlap, but Women's History Month. So thank you so much, and we'd be honored to take any Questions you have, if you'd like to contact us, this is our, our emails, but happy to take any questions from the chat or, or uh, online.
Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, that's great. And I also like, I had to hold myself back to read more about Maxine Dunlap. I wanted to wait for the presentation. So. Okay, good. <laughs> well, if you find out more, Christina, please let us know. Yeah, but now I was like, oh, there's some gaps. I could go find yeah, out yeah, more absolutely. info. Absolutely, please do. Okay. Yeah, please. Now I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> so perfect. Um, so for those who would like um, to ask any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section of um, the, not the chat, but the Q&A section. But it looks like we have a couple already. So I'm going to read um, a few of those. Um, oh, is it? And one's kind of a little semi-popular question too. Mm. Um, so the first one is gliding is a relatively small part of the aviation world. Um, I guess that depends on perspectives. So, um, but the main one is, um, have either of you um, been flying in a glider? So that's the first question. Um, I'll, I'll take it first. Um, and then Madison, if you haven't had a glider experience, we need to get you in a glider. Um, I've had the pleasure of being in gliders um, as a passenger uh, all around the world, uh, here in California, in Germany, in Hawaii, uh, all with very experienced pilots as a passenger. I've never had the honor of getting a license because I have a garage full of model gliders. And it's, that's my passion. And it's, that's just where I'm going to go and stay, stay doing. Um, but I need to remind everyone that um, it is the case with powered flight that as soon as the powered engines don't work anymore, it's a glider. So the best powered pilots are also glider pilots and they know how to handle an aircraft, even if it has no motors, uh, to make use of the atmosphere to continue their, their flight. Madison. All right. Um, so I guess we will have to get me in a glider. I grew up not really, I didn't really have anyone in my family or like family friends or anyone that was like a, into flight. So it was really just me kind of figuring this out. And thankfully I met Dr. Fogel my freshman year um, at San Diego State. So I was able to learn so much more, but I need to get into a glider. I go to the glider, the Torrey Pines like glider place, the little where the golf course is and they go parasailing and paragliding and I'm always like whoa like that is so cool but yeah I haven't gotten the opportunity but I would love to over Germany Hawaii any, <laughs> any of those places would be nice <laughs> I'll add one more comment uh I was doing my bachelor's degree at UC Santa Cruz uh in the 80s and uh one weekend I took the time off to go to Fremont because at Fremont they had a glider port uh a sky sailing glider port on the West side of the 880 there for a little while and took a wonderful flight uh, flying back and forth on Mission Ridge uh, with a, again, with a, as a passenger, but uh, a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, that airport's no longer there. It's now built up, but that, in, that group moved to San Diego. So now they operate a glider port in Warner Springs, east of San Diego. It's the same company that was doing it before. Nice. Um, and I had, um, for those in the audience, I had asked Madison the same question too, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> and um and oh and I guess I think you Dr. Fogel you had shared some of what you went over but somebody had asked if um if you had soared over um any of the landmarks mentioned this evening but yeah great question so unfortunately of course you know uh development is development and a lot of the sand dunes are now under houses um so, and, and, and in fact, I bet hardly any of the people living on the west side of San Francisco know anything about the gliding activities that happen there. It's very deserving of having a plaque there to honor Maxine and the first woman's glider license uh, in that area. Uh, something like that should be done. But um, of course, I've flown over that area a lot in, in commercial aircraft out of SFO, but never in a glider. Um, yeah, I did notice there was one chat that came through about Chrissy Field. And of course, Chrissy Field was an aviation field for some time. There was another field, uh, which is now Marina Green uh, near the Embarcadero, which was also an airport used for airmail uh, back in the day in the 1920s. That was actually Montgomery Field, named after John Montgomery, the glider pilot that I had mentioned to you before, uh, before it was Marina Green. So that Marina Green was actually a, a well-known airport about the same time as Chrissy Field. Cool. Um, okay, and then... We have another question here. Madison, maybe you're the best one to answer this. 
how many hours did Maxine fly during her attempt to, um, for, or I guess the question is like, how many hours had she had flown to do her record? I think that's what the question is. This actually may be a better question for Dr. Fogel. He may know okay. this. I don't well, know. I don't, exactly. I don't have the answer either. Um, and is it, is it, was it an hour thing that you had to fly X amount of hours or is that maybe like the gliding is like, you just have to be up. Yeah, um, so um, I'm not sure exactly which record the question is referring to. There was the attempt she made to to better an endurance mark, which I think was 22 hours by women, uh, by Louis Staden at the time. And um, she was unsuccessful with that attempt. I'm not, I'm sure the papers would say how long she stayed up, but I can't remember the number at the moment. For her glider license though, if I remember correctly, it was like a 30 second requirement. You had to stay in the air for 30 seconds without a motor. And she mm -hmm. went something on the order of 60 seconds or something of that nature. Um, maybe it's a little bit longer even. Do you remember, Madison? Uh, I think it was 50. 50 for... seconds. There you go. So 50. So almost twice as much as she, as she needed. Um, and that's that's hard to do at those days on those kind of gliders with a lot of drag in a primary glider. Um, they're just not, not aerodynamic at all. And so to be able to stay up for 50 seconds is better than most people can do. Yes. Perfect. Um, I think that was given a good answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and let's see, we have Madison, how did you get interested in this topic or how did you discover Maxine? Oh yeah. So I wish I could say I've been gliding my whole life and I just naturally, this came to me, but no, that was not the case. I took my, I actually took Dr. Fogel's, uh, intro to, aerospace class my freshman year and I loved his class so much he talked a lot about um the gliding he did um with the rem remote powered aircraft and I thought that was so cool so I talked to him and he told me he does a lot of historical research and we kind of both talked about Maxine her being from the Bay Area like I was from the Bay Area and I found the gliding portion to be super interesting just because that like we kind of said earlier, it's kind of like a, I guess, a smaller part of aeronautics. And I didn't really know that much about it. So I was like really excited to learn. And then it just was so awesome learning about the whole like California Gliders Club, like soap opera. It was like very interesting. And I just thought, you know, it was just a perfect little mesh of all the things I was loved to learn about. So to be fair, if I can add on to that. So as soon as yes. I mentioned um, this opportunity to Madison. I remember her being really excited that this was a woman aviator in the Bay Area, pretty much where she grew up. And she was really enthusiastic about that. I had researched a little bit about Maxine and, and had reached out to the San Francisco Public Library before I met Madison to find out more myself about this gliding that was happening. There was so much written about Maxine and the gliding part of this story in 1929, 1930, that I was sure there was gonna be like another, like, you know, 10 years of newspaper articles about Maxine because she was so popular at this time. Mm -hmm. So when I brought this to Madison, I'm like, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at the later part of her story, but there must be a lot there. And together we both went and looked and said, there's not a lot there. Oh my goodness, what happened to her? So it was really hard to find the rest of this story about her. Um, she just probably by design uh, did not want the public limelight anymore. As soon as she remarried the Coca-Cola executive, uh, she kind of uh, toned, her, toned her newspaper career down uh, mm -hmm. and, and kind of stayed out of the limelight. So it became really hard to track down what she did. And Madison did uh, great work in detective work trying to figure that out from the newspapers. I, I was hoping there'd be more, but oh well. She did a great job. Yes, yes. And that's it. Um, I was like, okay, I'll go find out some more too. <laughs> yeah, the, if, if, I'm telling you, if you can, that's amazing because there's not much there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a perfect librarian challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Come on. Um, let's see. And then Dr. Fogel, are you working on any projects or currently or research interests that you'd like to share? For aviation? Yes. Sure. Yeah. So I, 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 just, I do a lot of things, as you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, uh, I just published a book about this Park Van Tassel gentleman who is the balloonist that was helping Montgomery with launching of balloons. He had his own fantastic career in aviation, taking ballooning and parachuting around the American West and then to the world. 
uh, he went on a tour, much like a around the world in 80 days kind of thing, but went on the around the world as an aerial exhibitionist in the 1890s, which was kind of unheard of at the time, bringing ballooning and parachuting to Australia, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, Persia, Europe, back to America. And as a part of that, he also opened up those skies for women. So many of the the, the troop he had going and doing that tour, many of the people along on that tour were women that would jump out of the balloons with parachutes uh, coming back down uh, for paying customers to watch this spectacle happen. So if you go to Australia, for instance, the first women aviators in Australia's history were Park Van Tassel's aeronauts, uh, the daring female uh, aviators that would jump with parachutes. If you go to Bangladesh, the first person to have flown in Bangladesh's history was Van Tassel's woman aeronaut that jumped uh, Jenny Van Tassel from a from a balloon with a parachute. Uh, you go around the world and, and just watch this. He really opened up that kind of aerial exhibition for women too, which is a, a fabulous part of the story. Very cool. Um, oh, and Madison, just so you know that there, this is here, that there's a suggestion um, mm -hmm. that the Lake Tahoe area has world-class soaring so that's an ideal location for an introductory flight. Well, I will keep that noted because <laughs> I will never turn down a trip to Tahoe, especially in the summer. I think that would be super fun. Yeah. We well, need to catch it in and I agree. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and there's also a little, um, or maybe you could share too. It's more of kind of like a comment than a question, but um, there is, a greetings from someone in Eureka and there's some and they say that as you know there's California aviation history farther north than the Bay Area <laughs> and um so he's the person will be in touch in regarding that research oh. frontier but maybe yeah, you'd no. like to share some things that's perfect thank you for bringing that up absolutely it's the case and in fact um when Montgomery was um inventing and helping to invent gliding flight and aerodynamics. He spent some time up at Ronerville, Ronerville, which is up in Northern California as well, teaching, but also doing experiments with monogliders and understanding aerodynamics uh, up in that part of the world before he moved back down to Santa Clara to take up his professorship. So absolutely, um, we were focused on San Francisco because of uh, Maxine, uh, but of course, fabulous other aviation has happened all over Northern California, uh, more than we just presented today. Great. And then I think mine, is there anything that we should, um, you want to share a little bit about AIAA? Sure. Yeah. So again, uh, this is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, America's largest aerospace organization. Um, they have uh, youth memberships, women involvement, women in engineering, a lot of STEM programming, uh, very interested in bringing in young professionals to make presentations like type Madison uh, helped uh, at SciTech and also today, um, and a great organization if you're interested in, in aerospace as a career, um, the, it's the organization to belong to in America. Right, I think that wraps up the Q&A that, oh, ooh. whoa, there's something, Can't, let me just read this before. Sure. Um, da, 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 da. La, 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 la. Oh, it's kind of more of the, um, a little more of a share about um, kind of the, I'll just read it, uh, like the fate of municipal airports, glider mm -hmm. operations in the San Francisco Bay Area have been closed, pushed out by urban growth. Yes, uh, unfortunately happening not only just in the in northern California, but Southern California too. Um, there was a glider port at Vacaville that's no longer in operation. Um, I believe it's, there's also one in, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name, uh, north of there, uh, Calistoga. Uh, I don't know if that's in operation anymore still, but it's it's getting harder and harder and harder to find the, the land to be able to take off. Like I mentioned, the Fremont airport's gone. Um, and Hollister is like, that's how far you have to go away to find a glider port, which is um, not, uh, it's not the way it should be, uh, especially for something that's so environmentally conscious and not polluting and not noise making. Um, you know, it's the right way to be flying and it's so far away for people to use, which is a shame. Uh, the same thing's happening in Los Angeles. Uh, lots and lots of historical airports are gone now. 
And in San Diego, it's the it's the pleasure we have the Torrey Pines Glider Port, which is kind of like one of the last vestiges of these 1930 glider ports that dotted the California coast. It's the last one remaining, kind of like the roller coasters of that of that time frame. This is the last one, uh, and we had the pleasure of trying to preserve it uh, back in the 90s. Uh, still, of course, uh, always a debate and, and difficult to get um, piloted sailplanes to fly there again. We're trying our best to do that. But yeah, this is the way it's going. Kind of a interesting 100 years later. Unfortunately, I wish there was more gliding for youth involvement. Uh, it should be the way it should be. I should I should mention before we go, Christine, that mm -hmm. in in um, in Germany, for instance, where where gliding um, really had a rebirth after World War One, uh, a lot of the universities there have what they call an Akaflieg, a school uh, in the engineering a club that's dedicated to building sailplanes. Not only from the building part, but the design, the construction, the flying of sailplanes because it's inexpensive relative to powered aircraft, and it teaches university aged students how to do the construction, how to do the design, and, and, the, and the thrill of actually being able to watch something they've made fly. Uh, there, are, there are, each major engineering college in Germany has an Aqua League. There's also a wonderful Aqua League here in California at San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, that does that kind of training for students, which is fabulous. And I've had the pleasure um, last year to help start up an Aqua League at San Diego State University. So we're trying to infuse that kind of youth involvement in STEM and sailplane construction uh, here in California, at least, and see if that can grow nationally to get more uh, more interesting gliding. I like that. And as you mentioned, it's okay for the environment. So we could have had it for climate. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, this was very wonderful. And thank you so much for everyone who attended this evening. Um, you can also share the link uh, with your friends and family for YouTube or your groups, your gliding um, friends. And um, thank you, Dr. Fogel and Madison for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank, thank you, JP. You. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, it was awesome.